So this is M73. I think I'm going to dub this one the longest argument about the most boring object. It is pretty boring in comparison to the rest of the Messier objects. Is it literally a couple of stars? How many stars? Which ones? Yeah, well, we're talking about these four bright ones and then maybe these three down here. It was included by Messier in his catalog, obviously, because we're talking about it today. But yeah, even though it's boring, I think the story behind it is an important one still because it's a story of confirmation bias and the scientific process. So it's still really important to sort of understand it. So it all started with Messier when he was cataloging his objects that had nebulosity, which just means they were sort of fuzzy in the sky. Uh, and he said that that object was fuzzy. He thought it had this nebulosity and so he included it in his catalogue. You know, this was like the late 18th century. Most things that made it into Messier's catalogue were, you know, galaxies or, you know, supernova remnants, the things that really were sort of objects and were nebula. A couple of clusters would tend to creep in there as well, star clusters, because they do look a little bit fuzzy as well. Fast forward 70 years later, we've got John Herschel looking at the same object, deciding whether to include it in his sort of general catalogue of nebulae things. And he's like, well, I don't really see any nebulosity around it. It's not fuzzy to my eye at all. But Messier included it in his catalogue. And his dad, William Herschel, included it in his catalogue of general things that he was trying to update. And he thought, well, if they've included it, I better include it in my catalogue. So he was probably looking at it with a better telescope, wasn't he? Exactly, yeah. And so he couldn't see any nebulosity around it at all with his better telescope. But he thought, well, you know, they must have known something, so I'll put it in. And then it even managed to sneak in to the NGC catalogue as well. So it's got an NGC number, 6994. So this object that, you know, people have been like, is it nebula? I don't even know it's a nebula. It ended up in the deep sky catalogue as well, this NGC numbers. It's not a deep sky object at all. It's just stars in the Milky Way. So this idea of like confirmation bias where, oh, well, other people have seen it, so I better include it, you know, has man made it manage to sneak into all these catalogues when it's not even a a sort of fuzzy nebula object at all. It's made into these catalogues because people thought, well, then it's probably a, an open cluster. And so people thought, well, we better figure this out then. So early 2000s, okay, two papers came out sort of within a month of each other, both looking at this object. So is it either an open cluster or do these stars have nothing to do with each other at all and they're really just miles apart from each other on the sky? Um, Lots of miles. <laughs> millions of miles, exactly. It's what we call an asterism. Within a month of each other, these papers came out, one of which said it's clearly an open cluster, and one of which said it's clearly an asterism. Yeah. And they used exactly the same data and exactly the same method and still came out with complete polar opposite answers. So what they were doing was they were plotting what's called a colour magnitude diagram. Um, so people might be familiar with the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram of stars. So as you get brighter and brighter, you get bluer. And so you end up with this really tight sequence on a colour sort of brightness diagram of where all the stars lie. And normally in a, like a normal population of stars, that's got a lot of scatter around it because, you know, metallicity changes things and everything like that. But in a cluster that have all formed from the same blob of gas at the same time, you end up with a really tight relationship. So what they were doing was they were taking, observing these stars, plotting them on this diagram and seeing, was there this tight relationship there that we should expect? One group looked at it and said, yeah, it's clearly a tight relationship there. It's clearly an open cluster. And one group looked at it and said, no, it's just scatter. These stars aren't related at all. So that's, you know, a really important point about this idea of bias in your work. You know, if you go into a, p a piece of science research and you expect to find something, you're probably more likely to find it. I mean, it does look kind of clustery. It looks a little bit like an open cluster. You do have these bright stars that are all there together, sort of in the same area of sky. So there's no way of telling just by looking at it. I can maybe give these people a pass for interpreting the same data differently. I mean, yeah. these things can happen, but how did it also then get through peer review? Yeah, well, they obviously, both papers were independently peer reviewed. So if you're looking at a plot and they're saying, this clearly shows this, the referee might be like, yeah, okay, I can see that. So you can see how the bias spreads as well. Do you want to see the plots? Yeah. Side by side. So the numbered stars are the ones they think are in the cluster and the cross is the ones that maybe they could be, but maybe they're not. And they say, this clearly follows this tight relationship. Yeah, and then this one here, plotting the same thing, uh, where all the stars they think are in the cluster, they say, well, clearly it's just scatter and there's no relationship there. 
So that's the exact same plot as the other one before. V, B, v mi against B minus V, V against B minus V. So another paper then finally came out in 2002 where they'd actually thought to get spectra of these things. And with a spectra, you can get the velocity shift relative to Earth. So the, this idea of redshift, blue shift, whether the stars are moving away from us or towards us. So in a cluster where everything forms from the same blob of gas and is all sort of the same entity, you would expect that all the stars were moving at roughly the same velocity to us. You know, they were moving sort of together as one big group. Even though within the cluster, some are moving forward and back. Yeah, exactly. There'll be some random motion in there. But generally, what we'll see is a sort of a, they're all the same. They're all moving at the same speed. Whereas if we don't see that, then you can tell that they're not related at all and they're just this asterism. And so the velocities that this paper found in 2002, they just took those six brightest stars that are in this uh, the image that we saw before, and they took the velocities and they found everything from plus 34 kilometers per second to minus 52 kilometers per second. So this huge range of velocities for these stars, which meant that they had nothing to do with each other at all. They didn't know each other from Adam and it was just an asterism after all this time. I told you it was boring. <laughs> We're getting there, people. Slowly but surely, we're working through all 110 Messier objects. This is another one off the list. As you've probably noticed by now, we're not doing them in order. We're kind of just doing them as and when. If you'd like to help the cause, you can support us on Patreon, patreon.com slash deep sky videos. But the absolute best thing you can do to support us is subscribe to the channel and share the videos with anyone who you think might enjoy them. Thanks for watching.